Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to your Stratosphere Lounge. I'm your host, Bill Whittle. And, uh, God, this is 170 of these things. You put a lot of people to sleep with 170 of these uh, shows. But anyway, we're back for a brief uh, Wednesday before Thanksgiving uh, Stratosphere Lounge. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, not too much to report. I was feeling pretty bad all last week. Just really low energy. It is unbelievably warm in the studio right now. They've shut off the air conditioning as they usually do. I think it was 93 today in um, in uh, Sherman Oaks. 93 above zero Fahrenheit. So it's toasty. Um, I have been saving this uh, socialism firewall. I, was, I think I've said before, I've been talking about it for a while, I wanted to have three examples. One was Venezuela, one was Cuba, and the third one was Bernie Sanders. And I know that <clears throat> that Fidel had uh, died with $900 million, and Bernie Sanders owns three houses. And it was, uh, I wouldn't say pleasant surprise, a useful surprise for me to discover that the uh, daughter of Hugo Chavez, who brought the miracles of socialism to Venezuela, has a net worth of $4.2 billion. If you can be a socialist after this, there's something really, really wrong with you. And we know that there's something really, really wrong with them because this stuff has been going on forever. $4.2 billion, uh, Hugo Chavez's uh, younger daughter has in assets. Um, Fidel Castro, as I've said before, and we'll say again, basically amassed $900 million by making his cab drivers work 20 hours a day, every day for the entire month, no days off, by charging him $6,000 US dollars for a taxi license and paying them $100 in uh, socialist benefits and cash. And Bernie Sanders has three houses. When I heard the Bernie Sanders thing, I have to tell you, I just simply could not believe it was true. It was one of those things where um, I just, it was one of those things that are too good to be true. And when they're too good to be true, they usually are not true. Uh, but this one apparently is uh, the guy who's basically railing against the excesses of capitalism, who's never had a job in his life, um, owns three houses, and I don't know. I plan to use this argument to hammer people into the ground. Uh, next time I do a college event and I ask how many Bernie supporters are out there, I'm going to I'm going to wait for them to put their hands up. I'm going to tell them about the three houses. I'm going to say, "Don't take my word for it. Look it up." And then uh, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to wait, and I'm just going to wait until they explain it to me. They're just going to have to explain it to me, and I'm not going to go on until they can explain it to me, because they can't explain it. There's there's just no way to explain it. You know, you can't... It, I, I have a very high regard for Ronald Reagan. If Ronald Reagan was alive today and then just announced that he had uh, just passed a plan for single-payer health care, I'd have to decide whether I wanted to be uh, disappointed and stay with this erroneous belief that I had or whether I wanted to change my mind. And I would change my mind. I think any one of those three arguments is a mic drop argument, but all three of them together should take, I don't know, hopefully three minutes or less. Bam, bam, bam. Three hits with a hammer. Every single one of these people looked up to as a man of the people who had uh, nothing but the interest of the common man in mind and, and, and didn't let success go to his head and still stills one of the little guys and so on. When in point of fact, it is simply a scam for the least talented among us to amass $4.2 billion or $900 million or several million in the case of Bernie. I will admit that Bernie um, hasn't uh, collected the kind of fortune that Fidel and um, Ms. Chavez has, but we can basically attribute that to the Constitution and his age. Because if Bernie Sanders was young and good-looking, I think he would have won that election last time. So uh, there you go. There was a Democrat, Democratic, some kind of a caucus or something not too long ago. And I mean, like, I, I think, if, unless I misread the uh, data, which isn't, wouldn't be the first time, um, basically said that uh, 
you know, tw- 26% of Democrats called themselves capitalists, 43% call themselves socialists. And, uh, you know, my, uh, my inclination would be to let them have it. That would be the surest cure of it is to let them have it. But unfortunately, I can't figure out a way to let them have their socialism without me getting their socialism too, and that's not worth winning an argument over. So here we are again. $18 billion goes into the pot on the other side, and uh, wow. But you can flip them, so you just have to keep slugging out, I guess. Uh, So that's uh, basically it around here. Um, We have a Thanksgiving show I like very much. Uh, and um, beyond that, uh, we're just going to do a membership appeal on Friday. It's basically just going to say the same thing that we're always saying, which is we can beat these people. We're beating them. Um, uh, Oh, this is interesting. Um, The firewall I did on... uh, on the shooting where I said basically the leading forensic experts on mass shootings say it's not got anything to do with the guns or access to guns. It's got to do with the coverage and the, and the, um, you know, the glory of it. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward thing, not a curse word in there. Uh, YouTube demonetized that uh, video. And then uh, yesterday I did a Nexus report that I thought was uh, important enough to put out to the public thanks to the generosity of our paying members. And uh, that one basically talked about um, the connection between people like John Lasseter, who's in charge of Pixar and is creative director for Walt Disney, being cut from the same cloth as all the rest of these perverts out here. And that one uh, was demonetized as well. And they have the audacity, these YouTube people, which is Google, um, because Google owns YouTube. They have the audacity to to put, it's almost like, it's like a, a real slap in the face they first of all they decide if there's anything in there that they don't like they demonetize the content and then after that on a little line below that they put a line that says confirmed by manual review which means that it wasn't just an algorithm the algorithm saw things that uh, maybe pro- uh, progressives didn't like but obviously they can't look at every video that's posted on YouTube so they have an algorithm that you know, flags things that they find um, offensive to their personal philosophy. They take a look at it, and they probably don't have to watch the whole thing. I'm sure they just watch enough of it to see something that they didn't like, and then they they just demonetize it. And if they do it after it's made, in other words, if it starts out monetized and 20,000 views and 20,000 monetized views, uh, and then they demonetize it, then um, it goes. It's gone. So this is a problem. And we have to just look at the bright side on this, which is they wouldn't be taking this kind of publicity hit if, uh, if it wasn't working. Um, Cheryl Toomey just announced on the comment section to make the um, after hours uh, interview I did yesterday public. It is going to be public. It's public now, I think, on YouTube. But it's going up on Facebook tomorrow once we get the subtitles in. Um, the, just very quickly, for those of you who are not members, uh, the I, I did an interview. It was actually, I did it probably two weeks ago or maybe even a little bit more. It's been been a busy, busy, busy time. Um, but I talked uh, at length for about an hour um, with a guy named Chadwick Moore. Uh, Chadwick Moore was the editor-in-chief, I guess sequentially, I don't think at the same time, but he was the editor-in-chief of the two largest gay magazines in the world. And in September of 2016, I think it was, he just decided that he never particularly liked the left, but he'd always heard that conservatives were just so horrible and worse. That's basically the equation, by the way, for those people who are out there who are not Republicans. There's an awful lot of people out there, an awful lot of people out there who consider themselves, who who vote Democrat, who don't like anything about the Democrats. They don't like the social justice warriors. They don't like the the political uh, correctness. They don't like any of it. But they're convinced that the only thing worse than a Democrat is a Republican. And uh, Chadwick felt that way too. 
uh, but he became a conservative, and he thought that he might get a little flack for it, uh, but he didn't um, expect what actually happened. What actually happened was he, uh, he lost all of his friends the way that David Mamet did. And he got a lot of uh, hate mail and death threats, and the, the, the mail that he got was pretty much the same thing. I think he said it, it broke down into two categories. Either you're doing it for the money or you're doing it for the attention. Um, which is an odd thing to say to somebody who's extremely successful, basically loses his job as editor of this enormous magazine. I don't see how he's doing it for the money. Um, and, uh, and as far as the attention goes, he was getting a fair amount of attention before. This guy was well-established. He called it social suicide, and I thought that's the best term I've ever heard for it. We talked about a, a, a theme that I've been discussing for a while and that I've gotten uh, heard seven, eight, nine, ten times or something. And that is from um, from gay Republicans, gay conservatives, to say that be, you know, announcing that they're gay to conservatives is just a non-event. It's just, okay, well, okay. Um, but if you tell your liberal friends that you're uh, a conservative, then you're, you're banished into the, into the woods and the dark, alone with no food. Um, and that's basically what he, what he talks about. It's a really good segment. It's, the first one's long. I think I got five or six segments with him out of it. We'll keep some for members, but this, this first one was really important because it is so destructive to their narrative to have somebody who bought the narrative, who was prominent um, in, the, in the left movement, prominent, influential, who basically had the intellectual and moral courage to take a look at the facts and then uh, enough of the moral courage to at least explore what the other side is talking about. And when he found out what we're talking about and what we're not talking about, he said, these people are awesome and the, and the philosophy is great. Um, I don't want to give the whole interview away, uh, but I will tell you, because just because this was extremely, I thought it was extremely moving, I, I, I still think it's extremely moving. He said, um, he said that he, since he'd, since he'd announced publicly that he was a conservative, he's gotten a number of death threats from the left and constant accusations as well of, like I said, of being a sellout and Uncle Tom or self-hating gay and all the rest of it. He said the worst thing he heard from the right, and, and here I am bracing myself, you know, because nobody's, no team is perfect. You're going to have, you're going to have outliers on every, on every side of the political spectrum. And, and I thought, oh man, this is going to, well, this is not going to be, not going to be good. So the worst thing I heard from the right was from a, I think, I think I'm quoting correctly from memory, he said it was a, from a, um, a rancher in Texas. And I'm thinking, oh boy, here it comes. Uh, and he, he, he described this person who wrote him and said he's a rancher in Texas. He's a fundamentalist Christian. Uh, and he wrote Chadwick upon hearing the news. And basically what he wrote was, he said, I'm a fundamentalist Christian. I live in Texas. I got a lot of guns and I, and I have a cattle ranch. And uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I don't approve of your lifestyle, but welcome to the party and I love you. That's the most heinous thing that was written to him from conservatives. That sentence is a giant killer. If I could get, if I could get that sentence You know what? I just actually gave myself an idea. That happens every now and then. I am going to cut that sentence down to his sentence. And I'm just going to I'm just going to run that. It'll probably be 15 seconds, something like that. It is it is just absolutely absolutely fatal to to not just to the way the left um swings gay voters away from Republicans and conservatives, but it, it, you know I really should just get together. I should just get a clip of him, a clip of Antonia Okafor, a, a clip of uh, Alfonso Rachel, um, and and just just that, just that, and just put it out there and say, hey, you know, this is the facts. Uh, these are the facts, and you can take them or leave them. But uh, you don't get the fig leaf anymore of telling yourself that you're working for the good guys because you're not working for the good guys. You're working for the bad guys. I I, I I still I still cannot get over that email that he received. I, it fills me with a burning pride. This is one of those moments, and I have 
several of these. One of those moments when I just realize I, I'm I'm on the right team, you know? I'm on the right team. This is the this this is the side that that is actually not only just correct, because you can be correct and also immoral and evil and all the rest, but correct and um and and worthy, you know? Correct and, and noble and, and worthy of it, which is why they need $18 billion and I need 33 cents a day. And we're about evenly matched um, because of the power of being on the right side. So uh, that was a, a real pleasant um, surprise. I, I wasn't expecting to hear, for him to hear a lot of it, but I, I was astonished that he didn't hear anything. Was, and, the, and the closing of that, and taking the time to write that email. My God. Uh, so we should all be very proud of ourselves uh, for having the good taste to, or the soul, having the good taste for having a soul, one or the other, to be on the side of, um, of what's right. And we, that's why we don't have to lie about what we believe because we know we're on the side of the angels. We don't have to say one thing and do something else. And we don't have to talk about how the Democrats are at war with women while we're out, you know, putting our tongue down our, the throats of every intern that, that uh, arrives at your studio. We don't have to do that. Um, I mentioned in, uh, this may be what set the Google YouTube people off. I mentioned in that uh, Nexus report yesterday, if you didn't see it, that it makes a kind of sense, there's a kind of a moral logic to becoming a left-winger if you've got no moral core, because first of all, it gives you the opportunity to do whatever you want to, but more importantly, it gives you cover. If you go to women's events and you stand up and say, you know, I'm a proud feminist and I'm, I'm against this male privilege or this white privilege or this straight privilege or whatever, just thumping your chest about how, how good you are, it provides cover. It's a form of camouflage, really. People don't look at you, they don't investigate you, they don't make assumptions about you because you've, you know, you've demonstrated to them that you're on the, the team of the intelligent people and the virtuous people. And I'm just going to go off on a little rant about the intelligence thing too. Um, the, this, of, of all the things about the left, the thing that now, nowadays, I've been doing this for a while now, the thing that really strikes me now is how smart they think they are and how little they actually know about things um, in in every case they just constantly say this, these things I believe in science you don't know what science is just the fact that you say I believe in science I believe in science that's that that's that's I believe in it's a four word sentence that tells me that you don't have any idea what science is you Science is not a philosophy. It's a, it's a tool, in, tool of inquiry, very effective. It's not a philosophy. So when you hear people say things like that, they think that they're being smart. You know, they think they're showing everybody how intelligent they are, and they're not. They're just idiots. They've got just a tiny little bit of knowledge, and the same, same stories and arguments go round and round and round again, and you can just puncture every one of them. Oh, and parenthetically, um, I am also going to be releasing um, over the Thanksgiving weekend uh, – something I did in um, Irvine a couple months ago now. Uh, I did a very quick speech and I basically said, I'd much rather spend this time on question and answers. So I basically said to these TPUSA kids, and there were a lot of them in there, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. I said, I want you to ask me the kind of questions that these progressives and socialists ask you. And I want you to ask it of me in the exact same snooty, derisive, 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 insulting uh, tone. And so they did. Why do you hate black people? Uh, if you drive on the roads, then how can you hate socialism? And, and um, you know, all of them. And we're just, I, I don't, I don't know, maybe just practice, just banging these things out of the park. It's just, it's so easy. It's so easy because I I never, when I hear these things now, how, if you were a white president, how could you possibly connect to black people? I immediately look for 
the unearned moral superiority there. I immediately look for what they're about what they're trying to say morally. I essentially ignore what they're trying to say in terms of the actual argument because the evidence for that is overwhelming. Uh, but I try to I try to get a look at what are they morally saying. They're saying how can you possibly if you were a white president, how could you possibly understand the needs of black people? And my instantaneous response was, what are you saying? You're saying that black people are not human the same way that I am? You're saying they're not human beings? Is that what you're saying? It sounds pretty an awful thing to say. You're saying we can't communicate on this level? By that same reasoning, if I can't understand the needs of a black person, then why do we have black actors in Shakespearean plays? How can they possibly understand what a white man was thinking uh, 400 years ago? It's a disgusting and racist thing to say. Of course I can understand the plight of an individual person. If I sit down and listen and somebody tells me about the injustices in their lives, I can understand that as well as anybody else. It just simply is a disgusting display of racism on your part. And it's over. It's over. You know, they expect me to say, I don't know what they expect me to say, well, you know, uh, we've been reaching out to the black community. I, say, I don't believe in a black community. I don't believe in the black community. Um, I, I, I mean, I understand that there is such a thing, but I don't believe in it as, as a, I don't believe it in, in, in the same kind of structure that the, that the way the left believes in it. Got a big laugh from, uh, from uh, Chadwick during the interview. And I said, you know, sometimes people ask me, well, what do you think about gay people? And, and I say, which one are you talking about? You know, and, and uh, this identity thing has just got to stop. It's got to stop. And this is a very sellable idea. So, um, so there you go. Uh, and we'll get to the questions which I haven't looked at. I think that's about it. Oh, we, uh, uh, Foghorn. Uh, and um, notable miscreant and uh, degenerate Matt Lloyd, and I opened up the uh, the Star Citizen game a couple weeks ago. We've got about 30 people on board now. Uh, we're still looking for people who can do things like want to, you know, run the Justice Department. If you don't want to play in a game and go out in space and shoot things up, if you but if you think the idea of running part of a government that was committed to uh, these principles, then you might find some fun with that. We've been writing memos back and forth as if, from from the actual positions, I have a fictional character as the president of this republic, and I, I write memos to the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State and so on and so forth, and um, and we, we treat it as if it's real. That's the entire objective, is trying to build America in space, the America that should be. And I know I've said this before, but it bears repeating mostly for my own benefit. It is astonishing. It was astonishing to me and quite shocking that when I was putting together the government structure with Matt and uh, with known miscreant Matt and um, and Foghorn uh, Viper check here, it was astonishing to me how easy it was to want to buy citizens by giving stuff away. Is, is, I mean, it was just again and again and again. Well, we could get people if we do this. We could recruit people if we do this. And then I'm it's just a little, you know, it's like, what are you, you, what are you talking about? <sighs> just up for a discussion. So, you know what, this, the, the fun, the political part of this whole game idea is game theory is an interesting term for it. So we, we asked ourselves, well, if we're going to recruit people, how... And there are people who, who who are players who don't have a lot of money, but they want all the good gear. And if I can get some funding behind this thing, we can afford to get the good gear. So how do we make that work? And then I thought, could I justify expenditures on subsidies? Could I justify a government subsidy for a shipping concern, let's say, a private company, into an area that was in the interest of our government to develop, but there was not enough commercial activity there to make it commercially viable. Is that something I could do, or we could do, and maintain our principles? And it's a thin line. A thin line. But I think we came to the decision that you could probably justify that one. 
Um, because first of all, it's not a gift, it's a loan. It's a fairly um, risky loan, but it is money that would be paid to an individual private company to do shipping or whatever the case may be. We would provide a subsidy in exchange for a percentage of the revenues, and if the company fails, then the government loses tax money. But on the other hand, there's a lot to be said for the idea of striking a spark. We're not determining winners and losers. We're not interfering with the actual mechanics of the market. We're saying we'd like to have a market here, and there's not enough activity to start a market here. So if we put down the, the seed corn, or if we basically pour some lighter fluid on this little smoldering ember, can it, can it grow to the point where it's actually good for everybody? And I think you probably can make the case for that since it is a loan. Um, so we are, um, uh, Karsten uh, Mueller there just said, it sounds like we're struggling with the same thing the Founding Fathers did. This is exactly what we're doing, and this is exactly why we're doing it. Um, this, is, this is exactly why we're doing it. Uh, so these are interesting questions, and, and this is something I know I've said a million times, but it's one of the more important things that I, that I say. We cannot expect to maintain... Um, a political party or a political movement like conservatism, if all we do is show people parchment and ink and quills and muskets and uh, flags with snakes on them and um, knee breeches and all the rest of it, no matter how much we may revere those, those people, and we do, you cannot tell people who don't know anything about this that their future lies 250 years behind them. You can't do it. So you have to, you have to Put it in the future. You have to make it something people can relate to today. Ge uh, T.G. Gecko just said, how, um, how are you collecting taxes? That's a great question. Um, we knocked it around a little bit, and I said, first of all, I think that, that essentially, since we can't track revenues and we don't want to philosophically, it's disgusting, it, it, we would t treat taxes essentially as a system, of, uh, as a dues, basically. If you're a citizen of the republic, you're provided with a, a number of services, including military pr uh, protection, diplomatic uh, protection. You're, you're provided with a number of assets. And in exchange for this, we have to have some kind of money to run this government, run the military, run the, 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 this, this small government, this ideal government. So we decided that... the. the only way you could do it was we're not going to track income. We can't. There is an in-game economy that's coming. There will be people making in-game money, and the more successful they are, the more money they're going to make. And, and there, there are previous examples of this in a game called EVE and other games and so on, space games. So there's going to be an actual economy, and we can't and don't want to figure out what this person's income is, so we're simply going to make it a, a flat dollar amount. Uh, game dollars. We're not taking anybody's real money. And that's the best we could come up with. And I said uh, it needs to be constitutionally limited to no more than 10% of anyone or anybody's, any company's income. That's the constitutional limit is 10%, never any higher. Um, and if somebody has a better idea, um, I will be happy to listen to it. Um, we, could not, we could not enforce a sales tax. Otherwise, I think we would have done that. But basically, we just say, hey, you're a citizen, great. You now have these benefits of belonging to a country. You're not just a person out there floating around by yourself. You now are part of a nation. You have the same kind of protections that an American citizen has. Imagine traveling the world if you didn't, if you didn't have a country, if, if you had no passport and, and, you, and you, you didn't belong to any country. There are a lot of advantages to being an American, and one of them is live in a in a country where I'm not too terribly concerned about invasion or 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 that kind of thing. And the reason for that is because millions, hundreds of millions of people have made sacrifices and paid taxes and given their lives and so on to basically protect each other. And that is necessary. So the hard part is deciding where does that stop and this giant state begin? Where's the line? And that's why this is so interesting to me. Um, uh, Aesop just asked, by the way, I think uh, we had a had, uh, little adventure with Aesop last night and uh, five or six other people did a little training exercise. 
Uh, and I think he was flying the dust off helicopter. The question he asks is a great question. He says, do people have to be inside the game to be part of the government? And the answer is no. If the idea of creating a government interests you, and, and we have a number of departments uh, that are vacant, we'd love to have you. Uh, strata loungers would be perfect for this. So if you have any real world experience in this, uh, we'd love to have you. If you go to uh, Aurora Republic, one word, Aurora, A-U-R-O-R-A, R-E-P-U-B-L-I-C, Aurora Republic dot space. You'll see the work we put into this and you'll see the way we structured this government and you're going to see a lot of positions that are vacant. And if it turns out that... Um, that uh, it's something you want to do, then if you don't want to sign up with the game, uh, you don't have to pay any money to sign up with the game, I don't think. But if, if you want to be part of it, just send um, an email that says Star Citizen to um, info at billwhittle.com and we will get you hooked up because we need more real world people. Um, we have a, uh, our treasury is managed by, um, by a known miscreant and degenerate who nevertheless has uh, a significant amount of background in the financial sector. And we are hoping that that kind of real-world experience, if we can get real business people running this simulation, we should be able to do better than people who don't have experts. That's the whole theory, anyway. Um, that's the way we're training, and... Um, and we're taking the training seriously. And, and yesterday was, uh, I think, the third time we did a cooperative mission. Uh, the radio calls were better, but they're still not perfect. But we had, just to give you an idea of how this thing works, I don't mean how the game works, but how the entire political idea of it works. We had, I think, six of us last night on a, on a quick little mission. A uh, known miscreant and degenerate, uh, Matt Lloyd and I were flying... Um, flying air cover and fighter aircraft, and we had a team of three people going aboard, and, and uh, ESOP was uh, flying the dropship. So we land on this station, drop the, drop the guys off. They're going to go and find these uh, intelligence assets inside the structure, and we're going to stand outside here, to fly outside here and defend them, keep, keep the, anybody who comes in away from them during the time it takes them to do this mission. And when that is over, we pick them up and we get the hell out of there. So what's interesting is when strangers jumped into that area where we were, we were at a little station called Kovalex, and we can't control whether or not other players come into where we are. This is the beauty of it. This is the why it's so interesting to me and why it works, I think. We have no control over it. But the second that, uh, that unknown ships came into that system, I had a preset um, text announcement because we're talking to each other over a, a third-party radio system, chat system. So all of us are talking to each other through um, Foghorn, who was a mission director, um, military mission director, Mad Dog. So he was co uh, coordinating the ground team and the, um, and the aerospace team. But it was possible for me to send a text out that would be read by anybody who's in that area. And so I did, and I, and I just sent a text that said something to the effect of, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is Eagle One of, um, of uh, VF-1 from the Aurora Republic. We have personnel on and above the station. We will not fire unless fired upon. And the reaction from three or four gamers, players who don't know anything about me, anything about this idea, nothing was just this immediate kind of, okay, well, uh, you know, well, we, 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 don't, we don't want any trouble. We, you, know, you guys sound like it. And, and, and offers to enlist, you know, because it sounded professional, sounded grown up, sounded interesting. So it's working. It's just taken longer than I thought. All right, so it's Thanksgiving night, and um, I know uh, I don't want to be here real, real late. And uh, so let's get on to the questions, which I have not seen as usual, and then we'll do a short one call it a night. Um... I'm tempted uh, not to read this just simply because it's so unbelievably kind and, and, and embarrassing for me, but it's the top-rated comments, so here we go. Uh, Anthony Cazillo says, uh, Bill, this isn't a question, but I, just want, but I just want to know how much of an impact, I want you to know how much of an impact you've had on my life and others. 
I was 15 or 16 when I began watching your videos and you fulfilled my curiosity about politics and gave me structure for how to think about the changing world. I've gone on to lead my school's college Republicans, my God, become a commitment, a committee man representing my precinct and manage a mayoral campaign in my city. Good Lord, Anthony. There are thousands of people out there just like me whose lives you've impacted. I love getting the chance to meet you at CPAC and I hope I get to see you again this year. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and I remember you very well, Anthony, and um, you just I'm just not going to get too much into this because if I do, I'm going to just become overcome with emotion, but thank you. That's extremely kind of you. Uh, I was talking with Natasha about this uh, just a couple nights ago. I do not... I do not appreciate, and I don't expect I ever will appreciate the the reach and the impact that I have. Just saying it out loud sounds strangely unclean to me. I can't put my finger on why that is. It's got something to do with a real, genuine humility is beaten into me over years. Uh, but I've never assumed it, and I've never taken it for granted. And every time I hear something like that, or every time somebody comes up to me uh, in public, I am blown away by it every single time. Every single time. It never, ever, ever ceases to uh, make me very proud and 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 uh, extremely grateful, and and quite surprised, to be honest with you. Um. I, I, that's just the honest truth. I just I find it, I find it eternally surprising in a in a lovely way, and and uh, it is letters like that and emails like that, Anthony, that really keep me going, especially in the face of things like, you know, things like this. You, you just wake up and you read the news and forget all the destruction and decay that's just happening. You just read the news. You know, George Soros just moved eighteen billion dollars into messaging designed to turn this country socialist 18 billion dollars and and I and and as we talked about last time we can't get people on our side to 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 part with 995 a month it is very very frustrating and quite disheartening and I'm sure it had something to do with me feeling so bad last week physically but then I get um, emails like this one and then I talk to, um, especially talk to servicemen and, uh, and women, and, and it, just, it just gets me back in the fight, just makes me realize, you know, that it matters. So thank you very much. It was exceedingly kind of you. I'm very grateful. Susan Speakman has a question. Hi, Bill. Happy Thanksgiving to you and Natasha, and uh, from all of us, from Natasha and myself, to all of you as well. Happy Thanksgiving. The Hollywood and DC pervs who are being exposed for the sexual predators that they are are the perfect exemplars of, to of toxic masculinity. Yet when the left uses this phrase, it's not even remotely I'm sorry, uh, it's not even remotely what they're using it to describe. Seems to me that the left uses the phrase to demean all the masculine virtues that the human race needs to survive. Do they not understand that by heaping such a opprobrium on these manly ideals? They may well be hastening the end of Western civilization, or is that a feature for them rather than a bug? Great question. Great question. It is a feature for them rather than a bug. There's a theory of um, how genes are passed on through generations, and it's called RK theory. There you go. For those of you who've been basically waiting for a drink of alcohol for the last year or whatever, I, haven't th I don't think I've said those letters in quite a long time. But as most of you know by heart by now, uh, one reproductive strategy is to spend a great deal of effort and time on raising quality individuals. That would be the R strategy, the reproductive rate strategy. And a rabbit is a good example of a species that just makes lots and lots. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Well, I was talking about creating a quality individual. That would be a K species, um, like wolves, for example, where the food source is relatively scarce and it's not enough uh, to support large numbers of, of your population, so you adopt a strategy where you go for quality over quantity. That's the K theory. And then the R theory is if everything seems to be like lots and lots of resources everywhere, you're in an open field of clover, let's say, and you're a rabbit, 
there's no reason to make a better rabbit. You're simply wasting opportunities to make more rabbits. So you go with the quantity over quality and, the, and, the, and, and so on. So the reason I bring all this up is um, when the left talks about toxic masculinity, uh, <laughs> I'm having a problem with able mouth today. Toxic masculinity, they are talking about the John Wayne uh, Gary Cooper virtues. They're talking about the virtues of the kind of people who would never in a million years do the kind of things that we hear are coming out of Hollywood and, and Washington. Not in a million years. They are, this is good for them because as our, our uh, type individuals, beta individuals, what they want is they want actual strong men to be devalued as much as possible so that these uh, Morality free um, thieves and malcontents can get the broads. That's what it's all about. I know it sounds um, harsh, but we're here because of our, our reproductive uh, urges, and the same is true for every other species on the earth. That's why this theory holds so much water for me. In other words, if, if you are Let's say that you're Harvey Weinstein. I'm just going to pause for a moment to let the horror and shock of that sink in. But just to go to extremes, let's say you're Harvey Weinstein. And, uh, and you are looking for as much action as you possibly can get. And since it's a hypothetical, let's just say that you are at a party and the only two males at the party are you and Gary Cooper. Now, everybody knows, no matter what they say, no matter what feminists say, no matter what especially these male feminists say, everybody knows that every woman at that party is going to be attracted to the Gary Cooper character, not because he's better looking or taller, but because he's got it. And if the physical exteriors were reversed, it'd take a little longer, but they would still go for the, they'd go for the strength. They'd go for the quiet strength, the, the quiet goodness, but this steeliness in the eye, you know, that, that says, I'm a good person, and I'm a gentle person, and I'm a kind person, but if you mess with us, I'm going to kill everybody you know, and you as well. That kind of thing, you know, that kind of maddest kind of honorable thing. If you're Harvey Weinstein and you're at a cocktail party and it's you and Gary Cooper, your only chance is to, is to convince people that Gary Cooper is a threat, that he's dangerous, that he's not only a dinosaur, but that he's, but that he's evil. And that will then start to set up a conflict inside other people's um, moral matrix. And then they'll start thinking, boy, this Harvey Weinstein guy is a horrible-looking, horrible-seeming man, but he makes some interesting points about Gary Cooper, who's probably a bigger threat. Next thing you know, Harvey Weinstein is uh, doing the Weinstein shuffle in the shower someplace in a, in a hotel. It's in the interest of the beta males to destroy the alpha males. It's not only in their interest, that is their prime motivation. And this is why so many people in politics are so awful. Bernie Sanders, back then, he's a great example of this. Does anybody think, anybody think, that this crazed old lunatic could ever make enough money to buy three houses if he had to go out and work? No. No. Not a chance. Bernie is appealing to millions and millions of people because Bernie appeals to the beta male. Bernie appeals, his philosophy appeals to the betas. His philosophy appeals to um, all of it. They, they, they don't have the drive, the intelligence, the courage, the, the stamina, the persistence, the ambition. Uh, they don't have any of these things. And yet they want to live well because they see the people that, that do have these things living well. And by the way, it's not a small cadre of 5% of the population that, that, that goes out and works and succeeds. It used to be pretty much the entire country. It's, it's a falling percentage now, but it used to be everybody almost 
had a word to go out and just go out and do that. You work, you got to go to job, you have the American dream, you have a house. Maybe it's not the biggest house in the world, but that's not the point. So these beta males think that by voting socialist, they will have the, the work rewards of other people distributed to them, and they're right in that regard. And they also think that by showing how feminist they are and how opposed they are to, to traditional masculinity and how down they are with the whole social justice thing, they also think that's going to earn them uh, some sack time. And in that particular case, I think they're dead wrong. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm sure it happens all the time. But I don't believe it. I, I certainly believe that there are women that, that would never in a million years admit to it, and I know that there are some women who actually, without question, believe it themselves that they prefer these weak, sensitive, feminist guys, but I don't believe it. I don't believe it. If you had that choice, I don't, I don't believe it. They, they, these Pajama Boy is a perfect example, right? And if you don't know who Pajama Boy is, for God's sakes, just Google him right now. He was what was he? Was he part of the Obamacare thing? I think he was. When they're trying to sell Obamacare, they had a guy, a presumably grown man, um, sitting on a couch in in a red one-piece pajamas, look like footies, you know, you couldn't see his feet, and he's got this gigantic cup of coffee which he's holding with both hands like this, and he just instantly telegraphed this isn't a beta male, this gay, I, I don't know, it's, 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 there must be an omega male somewhere, but this is this guy's not in the first four ranks. I mean, just the, the sheer childish weakness of this guy is just, just, just Google pajama boy. It won't, won't, won't take any work for you to see what I'm talking about. So what do you do if you're a pajama boy? What do you do? You know, you don't have the, the intelligence or the work ethic to go out and, um, and, do what you need to do to, to have a rel to, to have the house that you've just been photographed in and your big cup of coffee. So what do you do? And you're you're either too afraid or or lack confidence or whatever to to be the kind of person that people are attracted to. So what do you do? The only thing you can do is knock down the competition. Knock down the competition. That's basically what it comes down to. This is why, and this is why I think RK is such a profoundly deep thing for us. This is why. Liberals and progressives hate our own policemen and our own soldiers more than they hate Al Qaeda. I think that's a pretty clear, pretty clear statement. If you confront them with it phrased that way, they might give you a bit of an argument, but certainly their politics say that the American military and the American law enforcement is a much bigger threat than um, Al Qaeda or foreign sources or so on. And to them it is. They're right. If you have a society with actual warriors in it, they're done. They're 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 off in, in lonely land, you know. Um, and so, it's in their interest, and and it's actually even in their interest to make a war. I don't know how many of them are consciously aware of this, but I have no doubt in my mind that this is actually just the truth. That when when the progressives took the Vietnam War, which could have been over in a year, without any doubt at all. And we could have just put, we could have put, uh, we, at one time we had 525,000 troops in, in Vietnam. And at any given time, instead of sitting there and, and telling them when we're going to launch our strikes and coming in at the same altitude and the same bearing and the same time of day and all the rest of it, if we were serious about it, we could have we could have won that war in six months. Just put a giant armored column, drive it right up the Ho Chi Minh Trail, park it in the center of downtown Hanoi, and basically say, now find some people to run a real government. Uh, they, they, the communists didn't have any support in the South. When Tet happened, there weren't m masses of people just suddenly joining the, the North. It just didn't happen. So I think the reason that the Vietnam War took 11 years was because whether they're aware of it or not, it was in the interest of the progressives to keep that war going because that war was taking out alphas, on, taking out our own, our own alphas. Um, they were taking out their competition. Uh, 
they're not competing against uh, somebody from the Viet Cong uh, in, in the jungles of Vietnam. They're competing against the kind of people that answer the call to go there. And the same thing is true today. The modern liberal pajama boy is not terribly worried about um, uh, ISIS coming to America. He's going to take the side of ISIS over the side of a U.S. Marine because the U.S. Marine is going to cost him an opportunity or two here while if he can get that U.S. Marine killed by somebody else's alpha male, then that leaves the field uh, more open to him. It may sound extremely simplistic, and that's because it is. It's not simplistic, it's simple. And, and so much of, uh, of truth is simple. Just close something out here, I'm sorry. It's simple. It, it, it makes sense. It's E equals MC squared. Oh, boy, that was not good. Hang on, you're going to love this. Maybe it was something I should not have done. Hang on. Come on, baby. Yeah, better. Hang on now. Don't ever touch anything. This is what I should have learned. Uh... I should have learned this quite a long time ago, but I didn't. I'm not smart enough. Don't touch anything, especially not with Ustream. Uh, yeah, well, there we go. Close enough. Hey. Okay, so basically that's it. That's the answer. Um, they do know that they're, uh, that they're bringing about the end of the, of the world, but it's the end of the world for who they perceive their enemies to be and not for themselves. And finally, I'll just, I'll just close this, uh, this particular subject by saying this. It is amazing to me, again, comes to the, how smart they think they are, but the left uses Islam or the communists or anybody else as muscle because they're intellectuals and they're terrified of action. They're cowards. And so they're not going to go out in the street and fight. They need somebody to go and fight for them. But the thing I'll never understand is, what do they think would happen after that? And, and I know what the answer is. The answer is that these people, these progressives are so dense that if, if they were to get what they want in Europe, which is a little bit clearer than it is here, and, and, and have this multicultural world, and have all of the conservative elements of European society removed, then they think that they will sit down with the Islamists, and say, we were on your side the whole time. We're your friends. We're helping you. So we're just going to go back to our hot tub now uh, and have a nice glass of Chardonnay. And a guy's coming over and bringing his husband. And, and so we're cool, right? And they really think that this is how it's going to end. The big irony on, uh, that they'll never understand is that if somebody like ISIS if, or whatever, but just let's say it would be true for the Nazis as well or anybody else. If, if this country ever does fall to, to, a, to just greater exterior force, the people who are going to be the most persecuted are them. They'll say, we were on your side. We made it, you know, we were helping you. And the, 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 the people coming after us will not be impressed by this because they're not Harvard professors. They will look at this as weakness and treason. And the only people that will get a decent uh, shake, at least historically with Islam, are the people who these liberals think that they hate. The, the progressives think that Islamists hate Christian conservative soldiers and their families. And they do, but they respect them. And they have no respect for, uh, for these atheist uh, homosexuals, who uh, feminists, and so on and so on and so on. They're just, they're just not smart enough to, to know that. But that's historically true. If, uh, if Islam were to take over America, you would be given a choice as to whether or not you wanted to convert. And depending on the mood and the situation, you would either convert to Islam or be killed. Or you might be allowed to live as a dhimmi and have extremely reduced rights and, and higher taxes. But because you're a person of the book, because you believe in... Uh, the God of Abraham, you may be believing in the false prophet of Jesus, according to them, but you are at least a believer in God. Those are the people they let live. Those are the people. 
and and so it's just one of another million things that these people don't understand. Karsten Mueller. As difficult as the times are, di as difficult as the times are, don't you be thankful for all the things that happen? Like the Clintons, sexual harassment in Hollywood and all the other things? I am because it shows how the left truly is. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Natasha, and you, Bill Whittle. Thank you very much, Karsten. And I know you're, I think you're watching live over there, so it's kind of you. Thank you. Um, I am grateful uh, and thankful for many things. And the thing I'm most thankful for, uh, I mentioned in my um, Thanksgiving show, and I'm not going to spoil that here. Um, but the thing I'm second most thankful for is the Internet. Because, well, on a much smaller scale, simply because it gives me access to information and Natasha's, I mean, I, 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 I will be reading an iPad as I'm taking my socks off, sitting on the bed at the end of the day. Um, I just read voraciously. I just finished another one of Victor Davis Hanson's books and, and back and forth and uh, Solzhenitsyn and so on. I finished Solzhenitsyn, all of the Gulag Archipelago, all nine books or whatever it is in three volumes. And uh, Hansen mentioned in passing a book called Ghosts of Canny, which I'm reading now, and it's superbly written. It's only 745 pages, which is very disappointing because it, I'm, I'm probably a third of the way through there. I think I started it yesterday. So uh, it's it, the Internet is, is great for me because it just it, I, I'm becoming so much smarter than I was. Now, maybe it's not smarter, but, um, well, smarter. The decision I made last December was the best decision I made in my life. It took me 57 years. Uh, but I'm certainly becoming better educated, and, I'm, and, and every time I read something new, it makes me want to read more, and everything connects to everything else. And it's just fabulous. It's incredible how, how all of these things... Ah, see, I didn't realize that. I didn't, for instance, just for instance, this afternoon... I was reading about the Carthaginians. I didn't know anything about the Carthaginians. The Romans were built for war. The Carthaginians were built to trade. And that's why there's a Rome today and no Carthage. But these kind of things are fascinating to me because um, human nature doesn't change. We face pretty much the same issues. Twain, I think Mark Twain said, um, history doesn't repeat itself, but every now and then it rhymes. And I think that's probably a good way to look at it. Um, so... So the, so the little thing to be thankful for is just how much information it gives me. That's a personal, uh, just a personal pleasure. The main reason I'm thankful for the Internet is the only thing I can see out there that is a wild card in the, in the collapse of civilization. Uh, if I was reading what I'm reading now without the Internet and was just some unknown guy working in an editing uh, Bay someplace, and there was no internet. If I knew there what I know now, having visited the library any million number of times that I don't have to anymore, I would be utterly convinced that this is over. It's just a matter of time. But the one thing that's different on this point in the cycle is not that we're more moral, it's not that we're more intelligent, it's not that we're any of these things, it's not that we've got electric razors or, you know, no. The internet, it, it, we're, if we can avoid this cycle of destruction, it's not going to be because we have video games or any of that technological nonsense. It's not the technology of the internet that is going to save us if anything saves us. It's the ability for us to do what we're doing now. It's the ability for regular citizens who are not part of this suicidal death cult that always emerges from the elites. It's, it makes it possible for us to talk to each other, to, um, to uh, encourage each other, much the way that Anthony uh, Casillo did earlier, earlier tonight for me. It gives us a chance to realize that we're not alone, that we're not the, um, the last of a breed of dinosaurs. It gives us a chance to rally, organize, put up a fight, all the rest of it. That has never happened before. Everything else that's going on has happened many, many, many times. Watching the, the moral decay of the society makes you sound like the... And by the way, this is more about the power of movies, right? When I talk about things like watching the moral decay of America, to many people out there, it makes me sound like the, the, the uh, 
preacher in in Footloose, right? I'm John Lithgow. I'm a I'm a I'm a humorless, uh, passionless, joyless um, censor and judge whose severity is imposed upon regular people who are just trying to have a good time. I'm I'm the foil. I'm the I'm the I'm the guy to be defeated at the end of the movie and 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 all the rest of it by the fun-loving, happy people like Kevin Bacon who just want to dance. That's a product of the left, needless to say. It's casting that, casting that kind of role as a villain. But I didn't come up with this on my own. I didn't, I didn't invent this. It's happened many, many times before. And the idea that we're somehow different because of what we're built, because of our innate virtue, is exactly what everybody else felt when it what became time for the Etruscans or the Phoenicians or the Babylonians or the Egyptians or the Romans or the Greeks or the Macedonian version of the Greeks or, or the French or the British or the Spanish or whatever. It doesn't matter. The Mexican, uh, Mexica, Aztecs, all of it doesn't matter. Same thing every time. And the only thing that's different this time is this. And whether that's going to be enough, I don't know. Uh, but if I didn't think it was, I wouldn't be doing this. Um, so I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be able to talk to uh, you people. And, and um, with one or two exceptions notable uh, mentioned earlier, the quality of the people, for example, that have just joined this um, Aurora Republic dot space thing. Uh, we had a, a conference call a couple weeks ago. It's just, it's just astonishing to me, the quality of the people. Just astonishing how brilliant they are and how decent they are and how moral they are and how many of them are veterans or, you know, it's, it's just, it's amazing. So that's encouraging to me. We'll see. Uh, we do a couple more, I guess. Let's think I remember this name. Uh, Kyle E. Christ. I'm going to say Christ because there's no H in there. If it's Christ, I apologize, uh, Kyle. I'm going to go with Chris. Kyle Christ says, you say that collectives are passionate about things that they know nothing about, yet often my experience, yet often my experience is that they are along the lines of I saw this documentary or I read this article or I know this Syrian refugee friend. What strategies do you use for the informed collectivist of those who think they are informed. I call it passionately misinformed. That's a great uh, term too, they're passionately misinformed. This is one of the first things I ever started saying about myself in terms of the work I do. When I was a young person, when I was 20, surrounded by li liberals in the, in the theater department, I was extremely passionate. I passionately believed in things I know nothing about. Nothing. I was wrong about virtually everything. I wasn't wrong about America because I loved America, I loved the military, and I loved business. But, but, I, but everything, but the way to get there, I was just I was I was 180 degrees wrong about all of it, all of it, and and yet I was, on some level, I was much more passionate than I am now. I was much more you know agitated and angry and 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 my more energy when I was 20 and all this other stuff. I just was wrong about everything. Um, so I think to answer your question, um, that th there are irrefutable arguments. And for, for whatever percentage of the population that is, forget whether they're liberal or conservative, whether or not they're emotionally, I'm sorry, intellectually honest enough, and whether they have enough of a moral core to decide that they want to be correct, that they want to know what the truth is, those people can be recovered very quickly in, in the state of several very brief little arguments. Um, as I've mentioned before, the one I remember most distinctly for me was probably around 85, maybe a little earlier, whenever. Uh, the movie Glory had just come out, and I was reading Newsweek magazine and agreeing everything with everything in it, and the back page alternated between um, Martha Quinn's mom and, and this guy named George Will, and George Will was talking about how Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton was saying, um, you know, you 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 have to respect us. You have to give. You, no, it wasn't that. He said, we we need this politically, and you, you and you have to give us this victory. And 
George Will said, if I give it to you, it's not a victory. Respect is not something that you can demand of somebody. You can make the demand, but it doesn't mean they're going to respect you. You have to earn it. He started talking about the movie Glory and how um, how the soldiers in that movie weren't going to the Confederates or the white Union soldiers next to him and say, we demand that you respect us. They went out there and fought just as well as anybody else, better perhaps, and they earned that respect. And I remember hearing that argument, and I thought that is profoundly true. It's absolutely true. And, uh, and that loosened up the, you know, the, the log jam. When I was uh, 20, I thought, I, I, I really did think this, and it's going to sound astonishing to you. I thought that if a criminal came into my house and stole my TV set, then that was okay because I was a young white guy and I was going to have a big, bright future ahead of me and this poor person probably needed the TV set to feed their family and so who am I to complain about these things? First of all, it wasn't my TV set. It was my dad's TV set. Secondly, uh, I wasn't working to pay for the TV set and so it wasn't just a TV set. In fact, rather, it was just a TV set. It wasn't three months of hard work that got taken out the window. But I learned pretty quickly that people that come into your house to steal a TV set, and I was asleep in my bed, and the window was here, and the window was open, and I turned and I saw somebody halfway in my window. This is in the student ghetto at the University of Florida. I realized that person is not there to steal a TV set for, to feed his family. It's, this is, you know, this is Victor Hugo kind of uh, fantasy that people are out there robbing you know, because they just they just need a crust of bread for Tiny Tim. You know, it just it's just not true. It's anybody can see it's not true. That person was going to come into that room, steal everything I had, and I didn't have much. I was a student. I was stone poor for decades, and they were going to take the little that I had, not to do something noble like feed their or, or forget noble, even unavoidable. They were going to do it so that they could go down to a pawn shop cash this, you know, $100 TV set in for $18 so they could get a, a, a drug hit, and six hours later, it's gone. And now they have to find another TV set. And when the reality of this, it wasn't the person coming through the window that changed my mind. It was simple observation of the kind of people that go to jail. I have to tell you, I don't really, I've never really thought about this before. It's one of the reasons why I like doing the show, because I learn a lot of things myself. Um, but I never realized, I guess, until just now, how much my fascination with the show Cops really did ground me. I got to the point where I was watching, I was watching Cops every day in reruns late at night. And, and then I, when the internet came along, I started watching it online. I loved that show. I loved it. And the reason I loved it so much was over time, over hundreds of episodes, you begin to see what criminals really are. And it's not a question of somebody giving you a, their opinion of it. It's who you're going to believe. This, you know, Bernie Sanders, your own lion eyes. I saw, I saw innumerable times on Cops where you would see the video of somebody stealing something or somebody breaking something or somebody doing the drug deal, you'd watch them lean into the car from the hidden camera on board the police car. You'd watch them take the drugs or put it in her purse and then the police car would, would pull up and light up and they'd start questioning this woman and she'd start saying, I don't know what you're talking about. Say, well, you're, you're here buying drugs, ma'am. I'm not buying drugs. No, no, I don't want, what are you saying? And then he would say, can we look inside your purse? And she said, yes, which is not recommended by the way. Uh, and he'd pull out this this bag of uh, of crack, and she said, "I don't know where that came from. I've never seen it before." And pretty convincingly, really, you 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 didn't realize this was in your purse? No. Well, how do you explain it? I don't know. Well, I guess my roommate must have put it in there. And they're just lying through their teeth, and that you know they're lying. It's not like you. It's not like you you were, believe they're lying. You know they're lying because you saw it happen. And after you see that enough, you begin to realize that there are people out there that are just very good liars and they will tell you all kinds of sad stories and the second you drive off they'll go out and do some more of these things again um it's it, it's just uh, it's an amazing thing to watch and and the coolness uh, on and obviously there's some bad apples but not many the coolness under and i don't mean the coolness under fire although there's that i mean the emotional thickness of skin and and 
I can't really describe what I'm looking for. But this quality that the police have, especially experienced police officers, when they're being lied to to their face, it's just great. And I'll tell you who else I got fascinated with and watched a lot of, a lot of. I really hooked on and watched almost every episode I could get online, and for exactly the same reason, by the way. And that's Judge Judy. I watched Judge Judy I watched hundreds of episodes of Judge Judy for exactly the same reason. It's fascinating to me to see people stand there and lie through their teeth. And what also fascinates me, especially about Judge Judy, is it is incredibly interesting to me that if you are sensitive enough, smart enough, and especially experienced enough, as, as, uh, as Judge Judy is, you will almost invariably be able to see what is going on from the get-go. You ask one or two questions, and it's not even the information. It's the way the person answers. You can get a sense of this, I know who this person is, and this, and, and it just, I watch it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. It wasn't just the lies and the counter stories and all the rest of it. It was watching, I guess because I'm just able to pick up on this stuff, watching Judge Judy making a decision before the decision during the entire, you know, back and forth between the two stories, you could watch her say to herself, I've seen this kind of person a thousand times every single year. I know exactly what they did. I know exactly where the lie is. And it's simply, it's simply clear. And you can likewise tell who's telling the truth. There's a certain dignity to people, and there's a certain quietness. I'm generalizing again, but there's a, a certain quietness to the people who are innocent. When Judy says to them, I'm sorry, Judy, I didn't mean to say Judy, Shineland, I meant to say Judge Judy. When Judge Judy says, be quiet, you'll get your turn, the people who are innocent are usually quiet. And, um, and they're usually quite dignified. And the ability to be able to determine that is very impressive to me. If everybody out there had the antenna, and the it's not just the antenna, it's the experience that Judy Scheinlin has, we wouldn't have very many problems in our society because it'd essentially be impossible to get away with a lie. Once you've seen enough liars, and you see them, you watch them lie in front of your eyes, you know what, you know what they're all about. And she said something, I, you know, I didn't watch her over years and years and years, I just watched a bunch of episodes, kind of binge watched it for months and months, but. One thing she said frequently was, don't try this with me. I'm much smarter than you. I'm much smarter than you. And I thought, wow. What a cool thing to say. For a number of reasons. She is smarter than them, needless to say. Certainly smarter than the average street criminal and that kind of thing. But even when you get kind of, you know, brightish kind of people who are trying to pull some kind of con or trying to get out of something... She would say, I'm smarter than you, and she was. She was wiser than them as well. Which brings me to a completely different subject, which is absolutely... Some, I, I've been meaning to talk about this forever, and just, just never have. It's connected to what I just said about Judge Judy. It's not correct, connected to anything else. I'll run with this for a little while. We'll call it a night. Um, but just to wrap up the Judy thing, uh, I have to say I was enormously disappointed. And I may be wrong about this, but I don't think I am. Enormously disappointed when I found out that the court costs are paid by the show. So when uh, Judge Judy says, um, you know, uh, verdict in favor of the uh, plaintiff, and bangs her gavel and gets out of there, and then the person who's been lying through their teeth about $2,370, lying through their teeth, they've been found to be, there is no claim, or, or the claim against them is valid or whatever, and then I find out that the $2,380 is paid for by the show and not by the person who I just watched lie their way through 15 minutes of television. That was disappointing to me. I would have liked it much better if it turned out there was actual justice going on there and not TV justice. Nevertheless, as a study of human behavior, I cannot recommend it highly enough. If you search on, the, on YouTube, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And you'll just get a look at some of the... Um, just look at, at, at just five of them, you know. You'll see it. Um, 
Yeah, she's a profoundly wise person. I admire her very much. Okay, so this uh, tangent that I was off on is just completely different, but it's a good thing to kind of wrap the show up on because it's got nothing to do with anything out there at all. So Judge Judy said that um, I'm much smarter than you are, and she's right. And this has been something I've been thinking about for a while. And when you get down to the brass tacks of it, it's actually kind of an interesting thing to think about. And that is, how would you fight an enemy who was much smarter than you? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. How would you fight against an enemy, let's say an alien invasion or something, that was smarter than you are, significantly smarter than you are? They would have the ability to predict pretty much everything you were going to do in the same way that you could predict what a four-year-old is going to do with the cookies out there or whatever. How would, you, how would you fight a fight like that? Probably the first question is, would you be smart enough to not do the fight at all? I suppose that's the first answer because you're not going to win. Um, however, it's an interesting thought experiment. What, how, would you, how would you deal with an adversary who was noticeably significantly smarter than you? That's a, that's a, that's a real intellectual challenge, actually. Um, and the only thing I could keep coming back to was, um, was this idea that since they are so much smarter than us or me, their ability to predict what we would do, including things like doing what's not expected of us, that they would be so many steps ahead of us on the chessboard, so many moves ahead of us on the chessboard, that if we thought, well, we're going to do this, and then we said to ourselves, oh, no, 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 we're going to do this because they expect us to do this, but we're actually going to do this, and then you know that they're smart enough to know how your mind works, so there you are, you're stuck with it. And the only thing I could come up with, and I'd love to hear somebody give me some feedback on this because this kind of silliness amuses me, what I, um, what I came up with was I thought the only chance that you would have at all would be to randomize your big decisions, was to, to not make them yourself, would be to have, to literally throw dice onto what you're going to do. Because, because that adversary cannot predict randomness. Randomness is, is beyond them. Uh, a dice thrower, a random number generator, or flipping a coin off the side of the you know, Empire State Building or something, it is, it is absolutely unpredictable. And you can't be unpredictable if you're trying to be unpredictable. I'm talking about an adversary, who, as, as I've said five times now, noticeably, significantly smarter than you are. You would have to make virtually every decision randomized. And I think that would not be an effective or efficient way to fight somebody uh, else, but I can't think of another way to do it. You would be a, you would use, uh, you would use the one thing that they could control. Now, now Bone Canoe here says, uh, use intelligence, judo, make them overthink and make yourself unpredictable. Right. But the problem with this is, Bone Canoe, is that they know that you're going to try to make them overthink and make yourself unpredictable. They're fully aware that this is what you're going to do because they're so much smarter than us that they know that this would be the logical thing to do for people who are as smart as we are. That's what you would do. Ohio Castle says exploit their arrogance. Again, it's like saying, okay, let's exploit their arrogance. Well, they know that we're going to try and exploit their arrogance. It's kind of like saying, you know, you've got, what do you do? It, it, it would be like they had like they had 24-hour eyes in the sky and they knew where every single one, let, let's say they're in a, a fort, let's say. And we're out surrounding it and we outnumber them, but, they, but they've got eyes on you all the time. They know where you are and they know what you're going to do. How would you beat them? And I just thought, you know, honestly, um, randomness was the only thing I could, I could think of. Uh, it just barely might be possible to consistently act just slightly more stupid than you are. If you were to, if, if you were to act slightly more stupid than you really are and... Stay with it. Take the the beating that that's going to entail. Then you might, if you spotted an opportunity, be able to then provide a response that they weren't expecting. But that doesn't seem likely. But that's also a possibility. 
Um, and, and then things like uh, Ohio, again, is saying uh, you overwhelm the adversary with sheer numbers and mass. Well, I'm, I'm talking about people that basically hover in the sky with anti-gravity, and if they wanted to just basically nuke you all, they could just do it. I mean, they wanted to sterilize the planet, they could do it. How do you get rid of somebody like that? What would you do? The, um, there is a book called The High Crusade, which was made into a terrible movie, but needs to be made into a very, very good movie. And it was about an um, uh, uh, alien vessel crashes on Earth in the time of the Middle Ages. And because um, Steve Darrow gets the comment of the... Uh, it's the comment of, you just won the internet, Steve. Um, and so these, these aliens crash, and they're very technologically advanced, but these crusaders are brave, and they know how to do hand-to-hand -hand combat, and uh, these aliens don't. So as it turns out, this group of crusaders essentially conquers the galaxy, which is a lovely story. It's fantastic. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's not likely. Um, so what was that? I was just going to tee off on something about that. Hang on a second. Oh, I remember. Uh, so then the intelligence test might actually be don't fight them at all. And, and try and reach a level of just sheer reason and intellect where you get to the place that you say the idea of having these overlords here is when I say overlords, I mean rel not, not the overlords from childhood and childhood's end, but but the idea of having alien masters over us is repugnant to us, and 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 everything that we believe in says fight them, but we can't beat them. So, is this reaction that we're having? an emotional reaction built into the organism that maybe is not in our best interest at this time, right? I mean, we, we, we fight because we're biological creatures. We fight for emotional reasons, and that doesn't mean wrong reasons. People go and fight for America because they love the idea of what America is. But if you were faced with that kind of opposition, would you ever be able to get to the point where you were able to say, is my love of America and everything that it stands for driven by emotions that may have no longer be serving our interests? These are the kind of things I think of sometimes when I've got a little time on my hands, which usually occurs while I'm on camera in the stratosphere lounge. It's about the free time I have to think is uh, sitting here right now. It's interesting. <clears throat> I love these kind of things. Um, uh, yeah, it's fun. It's also fun in the sense that it puts you... Sometimes the best way to, to get a handle on how your adversary is thinking is to reverse the situation. So if you're going to fight insurgents, this was kind of the idea of the Common Sense Resistance movie. If you're going to fight insurgents, it probably would be a good exercise for you and some other really bright people on your team in the intelligence service of the Air Force or whatever the case may be. Maybe worth your while to sit there and take a couple of six packs out in the woods and spend five or six days completely away from everything else and just have a bunch of very smart military types, very smart, independent thinkers, special forces, these kind of guys go out there in a room and say to, say to themselves, if we were invaded by reptiles that had complete control of the skies, that could vapor us, vaporize us at will, what would their weaknesses be and how could we accomplish this? We find out that they don't want to shoot at uh, women. Okay, there's, a, there's, a, there's an avenue, there's an option. Maybe they don't ever, they've never seen them shooting at somebody wearing a pink shirt before. Okay, maybe that's it. But then you would basically try to understand what it would be like to be facing an adversary that's so much more advanced than you are technologically would put you in a situation where the strategies that the people were facing who are so much technologically inferior to us might give us some handle on, on how they think and why they think what they think. Anyway, 
I think that'll do it. I think it's time for this boy to go home. Um, I will probably be back in the office tomorrow um, working on uh, that uh, message, and I'm going to start releasing some of these uh, TPUSA questions and stuff, but right now I just want to go home, I think. So um, that'll do it for episode number 170 on this day before Thanksgiving of 2017. Needless to say, I'm grateful for all of the personal things in my life, uh, which I've addressed elsewhere and which I don't think my wife has seen yet, so I'm going to save that. But nevertheless, uh, I'm very grateful to live in this country, and I always have been, and I always will be. I don't like having to catch myself and saying, well, it's a free country, well, it used to be, and well, we're the leader, well, we used to be, and, you know, we make the smart, well, you know, I've, of all the things I hate about it, it's the sense of having to qualify statements that I used to make with confidence about this country. With that said, uh, uh, there's no place I'd rather be, and, um, and nobody I'd rather be there with, so, than you guys. So it's been a lot of fun, uh, not just tonight, but during the entire 169 preceding episodes, and there's probably one or two that didn't get recorded or something like that. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, that'll do it for tonight. Once again, once again, uh, the small number of you who are um, paying your 30 cents a day or whatever it comes down to have my undying gratitude uh, for, um, for having the vision to understand that, that we are armed for the wrong fight, that all of our weapons and ammunition and rifles and guns and handguns and shooting ranges and all the rest of it is, is preparing for a fight that's not going to come. It's, it's not going to come. It's already here, and it's coming by physical cowards. It's coming from the beta males. It's coming from the R's. We're not, facing, we're not a pack of wolves facing another pack of wolves. We're a pack of wolves that are going to be swamped by a bunch of rabbits, and we're prepared to fight wolves. We can't fight them like wolves. We have to fight them like rabbits, which means the soft fight, which means the messages and the, and the comedy and the TV and stuff. People, some small percentage of you actually understand that and have um, and put your money where your mouth is and you make possible everything, including this show. And for that, I am extremely grateful and, um, and proud. So we got a lot of work to do. And we'll do it. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you, definitely. Um, I am going to have uh, an extraordinarily lovely time because my life has improved immeasurably. Uh, and uh, it's not due to star citizen. So, uh, yeah, that'll do it for episode 170. Thanks very much for joining us. Have a very happy Thanksgiving. Uh, don't forget to uh, remember that even though things are bleak, we're still here, and we're still in the fight. So we will see you hopefully next week. Be careful, have a good time, and um, we'll see you soon.